in the last, in the first chapter, which was a preface, uh, if you remember, uh, in the lecture, I mentioned the topic of uh, uh, the Fermi uh, paradox. Some of you may have heard about it already, uh, but some may not. Uh, uh, and I'm going to uh, discuss that Fermi paradox uh, in the context, of course, of nuclear energy. We know that uh, Fermi uh, will appear in the next chapter immediately as the pioneer that started or built the first uh, ever reactor that was designated as Chicago pile number one. And uh, if you live by the area of Chicago, you may have driven by or know about the Fermi lab. So the lab there is named after him. Uh, Fermi at, uh, in 1950, uh, at some lunch with other scientific colleagues came up with a question, quote unquote, if the universe is so big, where are all the other aliens? And uh, this is an interesting topic of the hour because on June 25th, in about nine, five, uh, nine days, uh, the uh, United States uh, uh, government is supposed to issue uh, a report on that topic of observations of alien uh, objects, uh, flying objects, and so on uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, another version of it is, uh, don't you ever wonder where everybody is? Uh, the question uh, is a valid scientific question because we know that uh, our universe uh, age, uh, say from the perspective of the Big Bang, uh, occurred or started 13.7 uh, billion years ago. So this is as far as we can see stars uh, in the rest of the uh, universe. However, uh, the Earth uh, uh, basically was created in uh, what we think today is a supernova explosion or a star exploded upon itself. And that uh, did not happen at the 13.7 billion years old. It happened at 4.6 billion years old. So the question is, if we are a technological civilization and uh, the universe is so old, 13.7 billion years, how come uh, there aren't any technological civilization that we can find in the rest of the uh, universe. And this is, became uh, known as the Fermi uh, paradox. And uh, there are many different theories that try to answer the Fermi paradox question. Uh, one of them is the zoo hypothesis. It suggests that societies in our galaxy decided not to contact us uh, to basically preserve us in the same way uh, or how humans preserve some natural places like forests and uh, nice natural uh, 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 locations uh, to prevent them from getting some kind of disease from, in that case, from humans, not from bats or pendolins. Uh, uh, so uh, we are living that situation now where humans may have uh, gotten a disease by uh, messing up with the environment, in that case, uh, with bats. Uh, or uh, earlier on, uh, messing up with the environment with chimpanzees, uh, hunting and uh, killing them and eating them, and that caused the Ebola uh, virus. Uh, so this is also associated uh, uh, with what's called the Great Filter. And the Great Filter uh, is a theory by cosmologists that limits the continuous existence of other forms of technological civilization. And uh, uh, it suggests basically that uh, either by their own making, uh, civilizations have to go uh, through some filters or they're subject to filters from the natural uh, environment. And uh, an answer, a, an optimistic answer uh, for the Fermi paradox, his question is that, oh yeah, we are here. Uh, we are just uh, very early in the uh, life of the universe, and uh, we are a technological civilizations, and we may be uh, the first technological civilization using energy. Uh, it is uh, maybe the fate of humans to go through those hurdles and eventually expand and be stewards of life in the whole universe. But so far, as far as we have been able to reach as human, uh, is, of course, the Apollo missions to uh, the, the moon in general. Uh, the filter hypothesis uh, is a very important one in the sense that uh, the filters could be 
uh, uh, na uh, from nature itself, like volcanic eruptions, it could be earthquakes, it could be astral impacts, maybe comets or asteroids would hit the Earth and cause extinctions. We know they cause extinctions already at the time of the extinctions of the dinosaurs and the rise of mammals. And we are the mammals that followed the uh, dinosaurs. The pessimistic approach or answer to the Fermi paradox is that some steps and hurdles to technological civilizations are so improbable to pass that virtually no one uh, does exist. We hope that is not uh, the case uh, because some of those hurdles are really made by ourselves as uh, humans. Uh, for instance, nuclear war, uh, the presidents of the two uh, large power, uh, nuclear power, uh, in fact, are meeting today. And I hope that uh, the nuclearization or the abolition of nuclear weapons can be on their agenda. Uh, we have another hurdle, the anthropogenic, meaning the human-made global climatic change is another hurdle that we have control on. We have control on nuclear war as a way of uh, being a hurdle that stops our civilization. And of course, so we have the third hurdle, disease, uh, bacterial and viral pandemics. And uh, some people suggest that it may be caused by the flawed logic of uh, research that's called the gain of function research. Uh, you can go and Google this and read more about it. But in fact, it's a disguise of biological weapons development. And uh, many uh, basically uh, countries share the same blame that it's done in the United States, France, the UK, Canada, Russia, and China. Uh, some people suggest that a fine-tuned universe would be subject to the anthropic principle. And that says basically, uh, quote, in order for the universe to be observed, conditions inside it must permit for observers to exist in the first place. As this is an idea being advanced by Elon uh, Musk, uh, the suggestion is that, oh, uh, uh, a much more advanced civilization may just have us as a simulation trying uh, some uh, kind of fun on uh, massive computers. Uh, this is uh, what's called the simulation hypothesis and the doomsday argument uh, that have been advanced. Uh, on a positive mode, uh, note, we go back uh, to uh, uh, this uh, answer to the Fermi paradox. We are here, uh, we are just too early. We'll continue our civilization uh, we will protect our Earth and maybe uh, spread life to the rest of the universe. Uh, and uh, uh, even though the Kardashian scale tells us that we are at 0.75 to reach a type one civilization in terms of the use of power and energy, well, maybe we'll lead the universe into type one, two, maybe who knows, three, but that's not going to be us. It would be our progeny or our children and grand, grand, grand uh, children. I'll stop here and see whether I answered the question uh, about the, uh, uh, the Fermi paradox. I'll ask you a question in the assignment uh, today about it here. Uh, if you have any questions uh, related to the homework, please direct personal message to me so that common chat is open for lecture questions. That's a message from Anshal. I have listed her in the link to, uh, uh, she's gonna help us uh, this summer as our wonderful TA. All right, so uh, we covered the Fermi uh, paradox and we go back to Fermi now uh, in uh, the chapter where we start discussing uh, the first ever uh, reactor that was uh, built. And that is first human made reactor and birth of the uh, nuclear age. And the interesting thing uh, in that context is that Fermi uh, was basically the person who led the effort uh, uh, of building the first reactor. He is depicted here on that painting uh, on December 2nd, 1942. Uh, nobody uh, uh, in the audience uh, or even your parents, uh, teacher here, myself involved, were born at that time. But this is uh, Mr. Enrico Fermi shown here with a group of scientists in Illinois uh, under the stag, uh, the, a, a squash court, in fact, uh, in the, uh, on the stag field of the University of Chicago. What we see here is a pile, a pile of 
uh, graphite. Graphite is really what we use in pencils. We call them lead pencil, but in fact, they are graphite. Graphite is uh, a form of carbon. So that is carbon, the isotope carbon-12 is a predominant uh, isotope. And uh, it was a pile. The pile was formed of graphite interspersed with a uh, fuel. And the fuel in that case was natural uranium, uranium that is extracted from uh, just the ground. Later on, we'll talk about enriched uh, uranium. Uh, the pile was surrounded by an enclosure made out of uh, simply lumber. Uh, it had several uh, uh, lines getting into it, controlled by a gentleman at the bottom here. These were control rods. Those control rods would absorb the chain reaction that was generated there by adding layer upon layer. You could see the layers being added to the pile uh, to reach what is going to be called the critical mass. Uh, by the end of the semester, we'll all learn what is a critical mass. And that is basically the secret of the nuclear age, whether it's in military applications or in the civilian uh, peaceful applications. So the control rods are going to absorb the neutrons and control the chain reaction. On top of the pile, they had a group of people with buckets containing boron. Boron is a very strong absorber for neutrons. So that was a safety feature. Uh, and in fact, it exists in uh, modern day reactors. Uh, there was an enclosure, uh, uh, a rubber enclosure, if something went wrong. Uh, it was uh, a Goodyear balloon uh, structure so that if radioactivity is released, they hope to add it to uh, or cover the pile uh, with it. The fascinating thing is that the Chicago pile number one had a very low power. And I ask, I'll ask you a question about it in the assignments by reading the lecture notes. You'll find that it was about one half of a watt of power. One half of a watt. Think about your, your light bulb generating maybe 40, 60, or 100 watts, not half a watt only. So it was a very low power. Compare this to the power that we have in existing nuclear power plants that can reach 3,000 megawatt of power, of three gigawatts of power. Remember, the unit of power is uh, uh, the the is the watt, which is uh, in the SI system of units one joule per second, joule being a unit of energy per unit time. So 3,000 megawatts, that's 3,000 million watts compared to the half watt of the first uh, reactor. So we have moved a long way from a simple experiment uh, to the production of power from uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, the interesting thing is that the component of the Chicago pile number one here are the same in those 3,000 megawatt level uh, uh, thermal power reactors. Uh, we have a fuel, in that case, uranium. We have a moderator, but except that the moderator is not graphite, the moderator now is water. So what is a moderator? Uh, the moderator is added there to slow down the neutrons uh, that are born in the fission process. And we'll learn later that uh, neutrons born in the fission process come out at an energy. Another unit of energy is the electron volt at 2 million electron volt of kinetic energy. Uh, the electron volt is the unit of energy, which is the kinetic energy acquired by an electron if you place it between two plates, maybe a condenser, with a potential drop of one volt. So if you have a potential drop of one volt and you let an electron go through it, it acquires a kinetic energy of one electron volt. So in fission, those neutrons are born at a very high energy. Uh, 2 million electron volts. And the genius of uh, Enrico Fermi, uh, our, uh, uh, our hero of the day, uh, is that he knew uh, uh, that uh, these very fast neutrons are not very suitable for causing uh, fission in uranium-235, the isotope that really fissions uh, when we use uh, uranium as a fuel. And uh, that uh, it is better to slow down the neutrons or to moderate the neutrons. So in that case, he used the graphite to allow the neutrons to slow down uh, to a lower energy. In fact, at 0.025 uh, electron volt, they become uh, very uh, slow and they become in thermal equilibrium with the medium, whether, whether it's a graphite here or the water in existing uh, reactors. So in that case, the probability of the reaction goes up 
Why? Because the neutrons behave more like uh, uh, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, or they called it at the po one point wave uh, mechanics, in that the fast neutrons uh, has to interact with the potential well uh, uh, with the, uh, of, an, uh, of a nucleus. And if it's too fast, you can basically visualize that it jumps over the well. Whereas when it is sluggish and slow, it can fall into the potential uh, well. So uh, uh, we are going to quantify this today. You'll find that the neutrons have to be moderated uh, to obtain that higher uh, probability of causing fission. Uh, the, the experiment that was conducted there was successful. And uh, basically, they, the participants sent a code to Washington, D.C., uh, coded the message, uh, quote, you'll be interested to know that the Italian navigator, Italian navigator, a navigator is in reference to Enrico Fermi because he was an immigrant that came to the United States from Italy, uh, 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 from the University of Bologna, and he was basically escaping the winds of war uh, through Nazism and fascism appearing in Europe. And uh, so the Italian navigator is not Christopher Columbus, it was in reference to Enrico Fermi. Uh, and they said he, he had just landed in the New World and the natives are friendly. Uh, that is an illusion uh, uh, that the experiment was successful. And there was the birth of the nuclear age. They called it Chicago pile number one. Uh, it was dismantled, uh, taken to uh, what is uh, Fermi lab today and uh, reassembled uh, with a larger power and named Chicago pile number uh, two. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, here's a picture of Enrico Fermi uh, writing on the board. So uh, Enrico Fermi is our hero of today. We learned about his uh, questioning the existence of aliens. Uh, and uh, 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 it is a topic of interest to us. Uh, the question is, are we the only technological civilization? Are we going to surmount the hurdles that uh, we have control on? Uh, global warming and uh, uh, nuclear war uh, pandemics, we are living one of them right now, as you could see. Uh, I think uh, the optimistic way is that yes, we will survive those hurdles and we'll be stewards of life uh, in the universe. Let's become a little technical here. The history, of course, uh, has to be learned so that we can understand the technology. As I said, the neutrons are born in the fission process uh, at a kinetic energy of 2 million electron volts. That's our kinetic energy. So we write here 2, 10 to the 6 electron volts. And uh, when they go through the moderator, uh, according to how Enrico Fermi visualized the process, uh, the uh, collisions with the moderator makes them fall down in energy to the thermal energy of the medium, which is in thermodynamics, uh, as we'll see in a moment, Kt. K is going to be the Boltzmann constant and T would be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the temperature uh, in Kelvins. And uh, in that case, if you take the ratio, you'll find that this is a reduction that is tremendously large. It's 80 million uh, time factor reduction on the energy of the neutrons when they're born in fission and they are moderated to the point 025. And interesting enough, that's not what happened just in the graphite of the Chicago pile number one. It's also what happens today in our uh, nuclear reactors, but the moderator in that case is either water in what we are going to call the pressurized water reactor system or heavy water maybe, uh, or even uh, graphite. Heavy water would be uh, uh, a form of water whereas deuterons uh, replace the hydrogen in the nuclei and uh, in nature, uh, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio, deuterium is an isotope, the heavy isotope of hydrogen uh, in that case. All right, so this is now the only picture that uh, I could identify of that Chicago pile number one uh, at the layer number 10, I think, the 10th layer, yes. And uh, you could see here that uh, they were uh, in the enclosure, they had those blocks of graphite uh, what we call lead in our pencils. Uh, I repeat that again. And you could see those little balls here in the graphite. These were balls of uranium. And uranium is a heavy element. And at some point when you reach a 
a certain volume or a certain mass, we call it the critical volume or the critical mass, you'll find that the chain reaction uh, can be now self-sustained, meaning that there are enough neutrons produced to keep the reaction going with a generation of neutrons. And the analogy here is to bacteria. Uh, the neutrons behave uh, mathematically the same as uh, bacterial populations. Uh, they multiply in the fission process and you want to maintain a number of those neutrons in each generation of neutrons equal to the number in the previous generation. In that case, you reach what's called criticality and you have a self-sustained chain uh, reaction. Uh, the design of the Chicago pile number one was kept as a secret uh, uh, initially, but uh, uh, it was uh, uh, patented and uh, the patent appeared after the war. Uh, one of the students uh, that took uh, our class here, uh, Paul Mickles, had his uh, dad work on that project. And uh, he sent us and contributed to our class here that picture of one of those graphite blocks. So it's a very nice thing to show it here. This is the a piece, one of those blocks of graphite. Let's go back here, look at that, those blocks of graphite. Obviously it doesn't contain uranium, but these are the blocks of graphite. It had to be highly purified, not containing elements like vanadium that would absorb the neutrons. And you could see here the notation, uh, first nuclear reactor, December 2nd, 1942. The stack field is, it was a squash really court at the University of Chicago. So that was the history of it, 1942, uh, the first ever chain uh, reaction occurred in our state of Illinois. Uh, this is a patent uh, that they uh, uh, patented with the uh, uh, patent office. If you are curious, uh, go and look at patent number 2,708,656. Uh, they show us here the pile and the control rods. Uh, the control rods are going to be uh, uh, the contribution from our wonderful electrical engineers to the control of nuclear power plants. You'll find the mechanical engineers uh, contributing to the cooling and the structural design, the uh, electrical engineers as a control. So it's really a, a cross-disciplinary type of an effort. It's not just the nuclear engineers. You'll find the civil engineers uh, contributing to the cooling and the design and the construction of the plant. Uh, the chemical engineers keeping the water in a condition that is suitable for the chain reaction. All the branches of engineering come together to produce nuclear uh, energy in general. All right, so let's become a little mathematical here uh, and uh, or quantitative. Uh, if we describe the energy of neutrons, uh, we describe them, as I mentioned in a moment earlier, in terms of their kinetic energy. And when they are in thermal equilibrium with the medium, the moderator medium, in that case, the graphite or the water, their kinetic energy can be described in terms of the Kelvin temperature. All right, so that is, uh, we don't say any more degrees Kelvin. The new terminology is that we just call it the Kelvin. Uh, the Kelvin, if you remember from your thermodynamic uh, or thermal classes is 273 which is uh, absolute zero plus a degree Celsius. So room temperature, if it's 20 degrees Celsius, would be 293, which is 273 plus 20 in Kelvins. Uh, K is a, a constant in nature, the Boltzmann constant, and it is, is expressed in terms of ergs. Oh, this is the third unit uh, of energy that we are introducing. Uh, last time we introduced the quad or the Q, uh, we introduced today the electron volt, another unit of energy. And here today we are talking about the erg. The erg corresponds to the joule, but not in the SI or Sistema International of Units. The erg corresponds to the unit of energy in the CGS system of units, which is centimeter, uh, gram, and second. So we call this a conventional system of units. And as engineers, uh, we should be versed in converting, uh, we are interest in energy, obviously, uh, energy from one system of unit to uh, another. So if you take the energy per Kelvin, uh, it is a very small number, 1.38 10 to the minus 16. So if I tell, ask myself a question, what is the energy of a neutron at room temperature? I'll take the room temperature, 273 plus 20, that's the Kelvins, and multiply it by K, the constant here, and I can calculate 
what is the kinetic energy of those neutrons at room temperature. In fact, uh, the if kt is equal to mv, uh, half mv square, uh, the kinetic energy in your class is in mechanics. And in that case, we can calculate the speed of those neutrons. Now let's uh, differentiate between speed and velocity. We all know that velocity is a vectorial quantity, the direction uh, of motion uh, that a particle takes, but uh, v is the speed, just the how many meters per second or centimeter per second the particle is moving. Uh, if we simply uh, uh, use the scissors rule, multiply two by kt here and divide into the mass of the neutron and then take the square root of v, we get the speed of the neutron. So what is the speed of the neutrons as the first mathematical example here of the neutrons at room temperature? You go uh, you, you, and get your k, the value of k in ergs per Kelvin, uh, 273 plus 20 degrees Celsius considered as a room temperature. And uh, basically this is uh, the K multiplied by the T 273 plus 20. It will give you uh, units of ergs because the Kelvin and the Kelvin cancel. And it's uh, 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 more convenient to uh, use the uh, units of the electron volt for uh, neutrons. So we convert our erg into electron volt and the conversion factor is 1.6 10 to the minus 12. You can get this from the handbook of physics and chemistry. And in that case, you find that for thermal neutrons, neutrons at room temperature in thermal equilibrium with a moderating medium is a very small amount, 0.025 electron uh, volt. Now in that case, so this is the kinetic energy uh, for neutrons at uh, room temperature. Remember, uh, this is a reduction of 20 million times uh, from uh, when the neutrons are born as fast neutrons. We said that is they are born at 2 million electron volt and the moderator reduces their energy uh, all the way down to that 0.025 uh, electron volt. And we calculated the ratio as 80 million times reduction in energy for us to be able to use them uh, to produce the uh, uh, chain, uh, to produce fission in uh, neutrons uh, uh, in general. All right, so next question. Okay, if the energy is 0.025 electron volt, can we use that equation number two here to calculate their speed? How fast are they moving? And uh, of course, uh, we know the value of Kt now, 0.025 electron volt. We go to the chart of the nuclides, uh, and I'll describe it to you pretty soon. And uh, we go to the or the uh, handbook of physics and chemistry, or go just to Wikipedia <laughs> and find the mass of the neutrons. And in that case, you can calculate the speed of the neutrons at those thermal energies. Thermal neutrons are the neutrons that have been uh, brought down in energy. So if you plug the numbers in the equation, V is equal to the square root of twice the kinetic energy into the mass of the neutron we can calculate that they move quite fast, 2.1851 10 to the fifth centimeter per second and 100 centimeters is one meter. So they move quite fast really, 2200 meters per second speed. So here I substituted E sub K as 0.025 electron volt. I converted the electron volt into joules per electron volt. It is in fact the uh, uh, the number equivalent to the charge of the electron, 1.6 10 to minus 19. Then we turn the joules into ergs, uh, uh, and we know that one joule is 10 to the 7 erg, so joule and joule cancel. And uh, in that case, you find that uh, if you divide by the mass of the electrons, and uh, we know that mass is equal, uh, energy is mass by acceleration, grams, uh, mass acceleration centimeter per second square, moving over one centimeter, that's work done, that's units of energy ergs. So in that case, you get, if you substitute the units uh, in the CGS system of units, centimeter, gram, and second, you get the speed in centimeters per second that you can convert into meters per second. So you could see here, those neutrons are moving quite fast and that at very high speed, uh, they behave more like a wave. So wave mechanics or quantum mechanics apply 
And this is a simple explanation. When they are slow and sluggish, they can fall into what you may think about as a well for the nucleus. They fall into it easier. Hence, the reaction is a thousand times faster than if you use only fast neutrons. And that was the genius, again, of Enrico Fermi, is that he had uh, the neutrons moderated uh, using the, the graphite. Uh, thermal neutrons or neutrons in thermal equilibrium with the medium are called uh, uh, basically the 2200 meters per second neutrons. Uh, we are going to do calculation on them as we proceed further, uh, or basically are also called thermal uh, neutrons. Uh, we can uh, uh, carry the same analysis here using uh, the special theory of relativity since the neutrons are relativistic in their speeds. And, uh, but uh, in that case, uh, if we do the calculations and I'll uh, save you from having to go through it, we get the same results. Uh, so they're not very far from each other. With some math here, you'll find that uh, the, neutro the speed using uh, the uh, laws of uh, uh, more or less relativistic mechanics because the neutrons are moving so fast, close to the speed of light, we get 1.95 10 to the seventh meters per second and uh, for the speed of the neutrons. And uh, uh, it is very close to the 2200 meters per second. If you ever find yourself working as an operator on a nuclear power plant, I hope some of you will get interested and just uh, become uh, operators. You will make a very good salary, 200,000 per year <laughs> to be an operator. Uh, in the experiment of the Chicago power number one, uh, they used the word scram. And uh, uh, when you use the word scram, uh, this basically means, or uh, what it was used by the group of people on top of the pile that I have shown you. Uh, the group was led by a gentleman called Norman Hillberry, and he had a rope that uh, he was supposed to hit with a, a shopped rope uh, with a single uh, a swing of an axe, he would drop uh, the control rods and shut down the chain reaction if it would have gone uh, uh, all right. So Mr. Uh, Hilberry's job was that uh, he was a safety control rod axe man. And if you basically take the, uh, this as an acronym, S-C-R-A-M, that is the word SCRAM. On uh, modern nuclear power plants, uh, the operators are still using that acronym. Uh, SCRAM means that they would push a button down when they hear alarms to, to insert all the control rods into the reactor and shut down the chain reaction in the case of an emergency, an earthquake or uh, something similar in general. Uh, in general, uh, uh, on the control uh, panel of a nuclear power plant, you'll find that you find lots of correct colored scram switches that are sometimes labeled RX strip. RX is reactor strip, RX standing for reactor scram. So the RX uh, is the etymol etymology in that case. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is that that Chicago pie number one happens at a period of great speed in scientific uh, progress. Uh, the experiment uh, followed uh, lots of interesting discoveries about the atom uh, and the nuclei. Uh, it started really in Europe and then uh, came into the United States with uh, people migrating from Europe to the United States. And the United States uh, has welcomed those uh, people. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, a base of uh, the, uh, the American progress in the sciences and technology in general. Uh, the first uh, milestone was uh, in France, uh, uh, a gentleman, Antoine Henri, 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 it's not pronounced Henri, but Henri Becquerel, he discovered radioactivity in 1896. And uh, two people, uh, a, a married couple, uh, Pierre was French and Marie uh, was of uh, Polish origin, both working in France. So it was Pierre Curie and his wife, Marie Curie, uh, followed by working with uh, uh, that radioactivity that Henri Becquerel discovered. And the fascinating thing is that Marie Curie and Pierre Curie are uh, credited for discovering not just one element, but two of them. 
uh, working uh, on the idea of the ores of uh, uranium. They discovered one of the daughters or the radiation products of the decay uh, radiation of uranium, and that is the element that we call today radium. And then later on, uh, Henri uh, and Marie Curie uh, discovered polonium. So they discovered two elements, that's fascinating. And uh, polonium was named after the native country of uh, Marie Curie, uh, which was uh, Poland. So she was uh, of Polish uh, heritage, uh, living in Paris with her husband, Pierre Curie. So they discovered the chain decay of uranium in 1898. So in that case, we'll, uh, uh, we'll study how the decay chain of uranium looks like. Uh, their work was helped by other discoveries. For instance, the electron was discovered already uh, by J.J. Thompson in 1897 in the UK. Uh, uh, we all heard about the uh, Albert Einstein coming up with the equivalence of mass to energy, that energy and mass can be uh, uh, interchanged. That was 1905. Uh, uh, Ernest Rutherford had conducted experiment <coughs> using alpha particles. Uh, the alpha particle is a form of radiation. In fact, they were named alpha particle because people didn't know at the time that they are nuclei of the element helium. So he used those alpha particles that are products of the decay of some radium, for instance, or uranium. <coughs> And he bombarded uh, basically uh, uh, the thin gold foil with those alpha particles and discovered that they can uh, interact with the nuclei and de be deflected. Uh, the alpha particles uh, interact with the nuclei of the gold. And he inferred the existence of uh, the, the nucleus, which is most of the mass of uh, the atoms that uh, we have in our universe. So he came up with a model uh, of what's called the Rutherford uh, model, where the atom is uh, like a solar system with the nucleus in the center, uh, like the sun, uh, surrounded or uh, by the electrons uh, around it, uh, uh, like the planets surrounding or rotating around the, uh, the sun. Uh, Irene and Frédéric Joliot Curie, these are the children of uh, the Pierre and Marie Curie uh, earlier. Uh, uh, basically, uh, 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 in that case, in 1930s, uh, they created artificial radioactivity. Radioactivity, as we'll study it in the, one of the next chapters, is a way that nuclei in nature try to reach stability. Nature loves stability. So uh, they reach stable nuclides or nuclei or isotopes by emitting different forms of radiation that we'll have a whole chapter studying. And then came uh, Enrico Fermi again in the picture in the 1930s, and uh, he had conducted their uh, experiments producing new artificial isotopes using uh, neutrons. Then came a monumental event, uh, chemists in that case, uh, chemistry people uh, in Germany, uh, two gentlemen, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strachmann. Uh, they uh, simply were curious about uh, the chemistry of uranium. They were chemists. So they bombarded ores of uranium uh, with neutrons. And uh, uh, lo and behold, they discovered that uh, when they do that, they find uh, elements in the middle of the periodic table appearing in the, the mixture. <coughs> elements like barium and boron, uh, 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 barium particularly. And uh, they start puzzling about it. How come uh, if you bombard that uranium with those ne uh, neutrons, we end up uh, finding something different that was not there in the mixture uh, before. Uh, they had uh, a student working with them, uh, her, another uh, young lady. Uh, uh, in that case, her name was Lise, Lise Meitner. And uh, they shared the information with her. Uh, she was adherent to the Jewish faith. And Nazism had started uh, basically it's, uh, showing its ugly face in Europe. Uh, so she migrated to the UK, but uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strachmann continued collaborating with her, exchanging information, uh, and she found a, a, basically a, a, an explanation for uh, those new elements that uh, uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strachmann in Germany 
uh, discovered in what it was in that case, what we call the fission uh, process. She explained it that the neutrons uh, fission the uranium nucleus uh, into two parts. And those two parts is what we call today the fission products. Uh, and the fission products are uh, in that case, the uh, results uh, of the fission of, uh, and she provided basically an explanation of uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strachmann discovering the process of fission. So let us note here that the process of fission was first discovered in Germany. All right. Uh, however, uh, Lise Meitner was in the UK. So uh, she uh, carried out a simple calculation uh, in which she calculated the, uh, uh, the Coulomb repulsion between the two fission products that happened from the fissioning of uranium nucleus and came up with a tremendously large uh, amount of kinetic energy carried by those fission products. Uh, if the neutron initially was 2 million electron volt or in fact 0.025 electron volt causing fission, uh, her calculation using simple Coulomb repulsion uh, calculations estimated that a single fission event produces, as we'll see in a moment, uh, 200 million electron volts of energy. This is tremendously large amount of energy compared to any chemical reaction. So here we are talking about one fission event producing 200 million electron volts, whereas any chemical reaction like the ionization of a hydrogen atom is only about 13.6 electron volt, not million. So the energy release from the fission process is millions of times, 20 million times the energy release from a chemical reaction. And that is uh, basically the new world we are uh, living in uh, today. So if uh, that energy, uh, people immediately realize that if that energy is released in a controlled fashion, <clears throat> we can use that energy to supersede chemical energy and the energy available in the uranium on the earth very, very, very far exceeds all the available energies from chemical uh, uh, processes like from coal, hydrocarbons in particular, coal, oil, petroleum, and natural uh, gas. And notice that these are all uh, the chemical form of energies that are stored uh, is nuclear energy from the star, our sun, but it is not uh, fission energy occurring in the sun, it's really fusion energy. The hydrogen uh, nuclei uh, fuse together in our star, the sun, <clears throat> and their energy reaches us in the form of light and the whole electromagnetic spectrum from light and ultraviolet and infrared and so on. So as I suggested, Lise Meitner was uh, uh, the contributor to explaining uh, to uh, 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 Strassmann and uh, uh, Otto Hahn, uh, the process of uh, that, what their experiments, uh, in their experiments, their fissioning uh, energy. Uh, Lise Meitner in the UK uh, understood the implications of that huge energy release, and she shared her uh, uh, knowledge with Niels Bohr. Uh, Niels Bohr was a scientist in Norway who immediately understood the implications uh, of that uh, huge release of energy. And he communicated it to teams of scientists in the UK and the United States. People in the United States now and the UK understood that that huge amount of energy can be used in peaceful applications, obviously, as well as war applications. Uh, one of the scientists is shown here, Leo Zillard, in a reenactment with Albert Einstein and uh, basically uh, they wrote, uh, uh, Leo Liz Zillard, who was a scientist who migrated also from Europe, from Hungary to the United States uh, with Albert Einstein was very influential having developed the theory of relativity. They wrote together a letter to at that time, President Franklin Roosevelt in 1939. And they suggested to him that the discovery of fission in Germany <clears throat> Uh, may lead to the production of a weapon. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, they created uh, the uh, fear of Germany getting, uh, and the uh, winds of war were blowing really in Europe in 1939 uh, at that time. 
uh, they suggested that the United States should embark on a project uh, to deal with the discovery of fission in uh, Germany. In that case, you'll find that uh, uh, in Europe, uh, in the UK, uh, they started a, a project. They called it the Military Applications of Uranium Disintegration in 1941. And in the United States, uh, uh, the project was kept secret <coughs> and was given <clears throat> the name the Army's Manhattan Engineer District Project. In short, it was called the Manhattan Project. You may read about the history of the Manhattan Project. And uh, the project uh, was given as a task, uh, as an engineering project to basically uh, a famous uh, uh, general uh, that was uh, Brigadier General Leslie Groves. Uh, he was uh, uh, from the Corps of Engineers. So engineers basically started into developing nuclear energy all the way from the beginning. Uh, Leslie Groves was famous because he designed and built the Pentagon uh, uh, building. He was a civil engineer and, uh, <clears throat> and he was given the task of leading that Manhattan Engineer District project or in short, the Manhattan uh, Project. Uh, basically, uh, he started the effort at the University of Chicago Metallurgical Laboratory, and the scientists there were Arthur Compton in 1942. Eventually, the culmination of that effort at the University of Chicago was that Chicago pile number one that we have taken some time to uh, discover. Uh, let me uh, jump that uh, part here. Uh, and uh, just go to the next uh, project. Uh, the idea here is now that the United States under President Roosevelt, who was replaced later on uh, 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 because he died, he was suffering uh, from, uh, <clears throat> uh, and he was uh, really uh, superseded by President uh, Truman. Uh, but uh, uh, following the Manhattan Project and Chicago Pile number one, uh, Miss, uh, General Leslie Grove, shown here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, he was a civil engineer, but he didn't know about the, the physics and the chemistry of the fission process. So he went and uh, sought the help from uh, Robert Oppenheimer, shown here. Uh, he was young at the time, but the two became a team in recruiting uh, scientists from all over the world. Like, in fact, uh, uh, from uh, Europe in particular, who came to the United States uh, under the leadership of General Leslie Grove. Robert Oppenheimer uh, was from the University of California. Uh, he was a theoretician in the field of quantum mechanics. Uh, he understood the implications of a process. So uh, he liked to go horseback riding in an area of New Mexico called the uh, Los Alamos and uh, basically established uh, at uh, Los Alamos uh, uh, in the New Mexico, the Los Alamos National Laboratory. If you drive sometimes in New Mexico, make sure that you visit. Uh, they have a nice museum to watch there. Well, uh, they understood, the scientists and the engineers understood that uh, the Chicago Pile Number One with its very low power uh, had very few fissions, so uh, you could not really uh, uh, study the fission process adequately. And they very quickly understood that if you produce the neutrons and absorb them in uh, the more uh, 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 available uh, isotope of uranium, which is uranium-238, you can produce plutonium, which is, is another element. And uh, uh, that doesn't occur much in nature, in fact, on Earth. So that would be an artificial element. Plutonium-239, it's named after Pluto. Uh, the planet that has been turned more like into an asteroid by uh, international convention. Uh, in that case, uh, plutonium was an isotope that can fission the same way as uranium. So instead of uh, separating the isotope of uranium-235, which is the isotope at fissions uh, in uranium, uh, they thought, oh, okay, well, let us get the neutrons from the fission of uranium-235 and produce another, what we are going to call fissile element, which is plutonium-239. So they find themselves building uh, that uh, another uh, pile, 
uh, at, in that case, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And uh, the rem remember the power of the Chicago pile number one. It was only half a watt, but this one now was in the range of 20 uh, megawatts, 20 million watts. And the way they built it is they had uh, a structure, again, made out of graphite here with holes in it in which they pushed little lumps of the uranium from one side and collected them on the other side, dumped them into uh, uh, basically trays and uh, buckets that contained water. Water is a good shield against radiation. So in that case, the uranium, uh, the neutrons were absorbed into uranium-238 and the terminology is breeding. Uh, breeding, they generated uh, the daily isotopes of plutonium-239. So they uh, tried to uh, uh, produce a plutonium-239 in that pile. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, it had to be cooled because it wasn't a half watt of energy, uh, only uh, half a watt of energy in the whole pile. That was 20 million watts of energy. So they had to use air to cool it. And uh, this is a part of the patent process. You could see all those holes here. And when you push the little slugs, small cylinders of uranium from one side, eventually they fall here uh, into water. So this is what's called the X10 pile. Uh, and they built it uh, in an area where they had lots of water from the Clinch River at uh, Tennessee, uh, the, the state of Tennessee, uh, at the site called Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge today is still uh, the site of a national laboratory. And this is, in fact, a picture of that XX1 reactor. You could see here graphite reactor loading phase. And that is the size of it, much larger, of course, than the Chicago pile number one. It was named the X10 air-cooled graphite reactor at the Clinton's Engineer Works at uh, Oak Ridge here in Tennessee. Uh, so as I can see, you could see all those holes here. It was a graphite structure surrounded with concrete as a shield and the slugs of uranium were fed and you keep feeding slugs, you keep feeding them. So the ones that you feed push the ones inside, but then you have produced plutonium out of uranium 238. So now the interesting thing available to Leslie Grove and Robert Oppenheimer was that they can uh, use two different uh, isotopes, uh, uh, the isotope uranium 235 uh, to create uh, fission in that case, you have to separate it from the uranium-235, or you can use the plutonium-239 that you would produce in a nuclear power plant. Uh, the first process uh, uh, is a physical process primarily because uh, uranium-235 and uranium-238 are both uh, 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 chemistry-wise uh, have 92 electrons. That is the atomic number of uh, uranium. So you have to separate that uranium-235, the isotopes of uranium that fissions from the natural uranium that you mine from the ground. Or uh, you could produce the plutonium-239 by uh, in a nuclear reactor. Leslie Grove and Robert Oppenheimer didn't know which process is going to work. So uh, uh, in that case, uh, the decisions of Leslie Grove was a judicious uh, decision, in fact. He said, okay, we'll try it both ways. So in that case, he uh, got teams to work on both the approach of separating uranium-235 from natural uranium or producing plutonium-239 from uh, the uranium uh, in general. We come back to that topic later on. Uh, well, let's uh, do it right now and then uh, uh, show you the detail as we go along. Uh, he, they created basically different sites with different groups of scientists who didn't know about what everybody else was doing. Uh, they coordinated the process. Uh, they needed uh, reactors that would have a much higher power than the X10 pile at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And those reactors would be in the range of 100 megawatts so that uh, you can produce lots of plutonium out of that uh, uranium-238 and the fissioning of uranium-235 isotopes. Uh, they needed lots of cooling. So they went to the Columbia River in the state of Washington in the Northwest United States. The Columbia River uh, is, uh, uh, provides lots of cooling there. 
And they called that site the W site. That was a code word. Uh, it's called today the Hanford site in the state of Washington. And uh, so there uh, they built uh, large power plants uh, shown here. You could see uh, the reactors here and you could see the Columbia River here used for cooling uh, the energy produced. This is another view here. You could see the Columbia River cooling those uh, power plants. And uh, uh, they uh, associated the production of uh, that plutonium from uranium with a large chemical processing uh, facilities, like the walls of concrete there were 15 feet in thickness to shield against radiation. A color photograph of the Columbia River there uh, used for cooling the reactors. All these reactors today are most bald uh, because they're too old, uh, but uh, they did the successfully produce the plutonium used in the Manhattan uh, project. So this is most bold. I think they left one of them uh, 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 as some kind of uh, national monument for people to visit it uh, historically. Uh, this is the interior of one of those reactors under construction. Uh, the reactor looked very much like the X10 pile, except the power of the reactors were 100 megawatt, 100 million watt of thermal power. Uh, they built quite a few of them, a dozen maybe, A, B, C, D, they gave them different names. And the United States started stockpiling uh, supplies of that isotope plutonium-239 that we'll see can fission easily uh, with neutrons, uh, in the same way that uranium-235 isotopes also can fission. So they used uh, basically those low, large piles, but in that case, instead of using air, uh, like the X10 reactor, they used water for cooling. And this is an actual picture here of the face of that reactor. Very much, it looks very much like the X10 reactor, but here the tubes shown here, this is some uh, engineers uh, on top of it, of the reactor they had to use water from the Columbia River uh, to cool the reactor. And this is an actual picture of the K reactor. Uh, uh, they gave them basically alphabetical letters uh, names. And uh, uh, those reactors now were, yes, they were uh, uh, now water uh, cooled, but graphite moderated. So they moderated them with graphite, uh, a huge effort of course, and it was conducted by the DuPont company uh, on a cost plus basis. So what is a cost plus basis? Uh, they basically charged the United States government uh, just $1 only for the effort of the DuPont company plus the cost. So the United States government paid all the costs plus $1. And the idea there is for the DuPont company to acquire uh, the knowledge and the technology from the process. Uh, this is, shows you the tubing and the water cooling uh, 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 tubes or pipes, uh, uh, channels, the name for them uh, is the name for them at those Hanford uh, reactors. And they were very, very successful to the delight of uh, 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 General Leslie Grove and uh, Robert Oppenheimer. This shows us uh, from the top uh, how the fuel uh, that was used in the reactor. Uh, it looked like cylindrical, as you could see here, and it's stored after being used in uh, large tanks of water uh, uh, for the radioactivity to decay. This is the face, uh, this is the front of the reactor, this is the back of the reactor, and this is the fuel stored under uh, water after being used. This was for the N reactor. You notice that there was K and N and B and uh, see uh, quite a few uh, of those reactors. The reactors had to be associated with huge structures, as you could see them here, the lengths of uh, uh, maybe a, 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 an ocean liner. Uh, they call them the canyons. And uh, look at the top part here, the concrete thickness. Uh, that is about 15 feet because of the, now the irradiated fuel in the reactor was extremely radioactive. They had to invent video cameras uh, so that they can look at them and periscopes. You couldn't look at those uh, uh, chemical separation processes. It was a chemical a chemistry process uh, separating the two elements, plutonium uh, from uh, uranium. Uh, you dissolve the fuel in nitric acid, different processes were invented and you get pure plutonium-239. 
uh, inside those uh, canyons or uh, reprocessing plants to be exact, that's what you could see from the top. All that process automated, you could see here a reactor here, another reactor, chemical reactor in that case was all that piping and the uh, process, uh, uh, the motion of the liquids and the, chem uh, and the acids inside there had to all be out of line of sight. You could not look at it <laughs> uh, uh, with your face, you'll get a dose of radiation that would make you either very sick or may even kill you if it, there is too much of it. From the top, you could see those reactors here, chemical reaction uh, reactors all interconnected uh, in those chemical processing uh, tanks. And they had a control room obviously here of those reprocessing plant. It was a huge project uh, to produce the plutonium 239. As I suggested, another uh, uh, way of doing the, uh, carrying out the process was to separate uranium-235 as a fissile element that can generate a chain reaction uh, from uh, uranium-235 from the isotopes of uranium-238. So in that case, they used uh, uh, an electrical process uh, called the calitron. Uh, I'll describe that to you uh, uh, in a moment. And they built those two plants here uh, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Now in that case, they used Tennessee again not because of the availability of water, but because of the availability of electricity. So it's basically an electrical process. Uh, they named it the Calitron process uh, as an abbreviation of the California cyclotron because they use a cyclotron uh, concept. You could see here, these are all magnets here uh, being uh, fed with lots of electricity. Uh, that bus bar uh, of electricity during the war uh, could not be made out of copper, you know, like copper would conduct electricity nicely. So they went to Fort Knox, the stockpile of strategic materials of the United States, and they borrowed all the silver there. We know that silver is an even better conductor than copper or as good as copper. Uh, so they used it during the war and then returned it back to Fort Knox after the war. Uh, General Leslie Grove built two devices. One, they called it the Alpha Track, uh, uh, each one of these is a magnet that uh, is controlled and the magnetic field itself separates the isotopes uranium-235 and uranium-238 in the form of a chloride, uh, uranium chloride, as, yeah, that would be UCL4. And uh, this is another configuration of those magnets with those silver bus bar on top. Uh, that project of uh, physically separating uh, the uranium-235 isotopes was built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee again. Uh, they named that site site X in the same way that site W was at the Hanford Washington Reservation uh, because Tennessee is famous for having uh, 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 hydroelectric power uh, and it has also coal power generation. In fact, the Alcoa company is at Fort Knox, very close to Oak Ridge in Tennessee, uh, Alcoa Alum Aluminum Company of America to produce aluminum, you need lots of electricity. So the electricity was available there uh, to separate uranium-235 using magnetic fields in that case. Uh, at the inside of those uh, two rings, uh, the beta ring and the alpha ring here, it's not shown in that picture here, but on the inside they had a, uh, a whole uh, 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 contingent of uh, young ladies, as you could see them here, uh, on the inside controlling uh, uh, rheostat, the currents to go to those uh, magnets. And those magnets were huge inside. You see one of the magnets here being put together. This is a coil. Of course, if you circulate the current in an electrical coil, uh, uh, if you move in the direction of the arrow here, you generate a perpendicular magnetic field uh, up and uh, down. So these magnets basically were uh, coils made out of copper or of uh, silver at the time. And uh, you could see the size of these uh, coils. Uh, those uh, young ladies uh, uh, were called the Calitron uh, girls. Uh, and basically they, uh, it was a large, as you could see, industrial process. Now, uh, even though the project at uh, Hanford was a successful project, significant amounts of plutonium were produced 
uh, those calitrons uh, separating uranium-235 in a magnetic field, uh, we will, uh, I'll show the equation for the Joule's equation, uh, how that is being separated in a whole chapter by itself. But uh, in that case, uh, that process produced only gram quantities of the uranium. And what they needed is kilograms, so thousands of grams. So it was not very successful, but uh, the material uh, was used in experimentations to study the, uh, the effect of uh, uh, basically the physical and chemical properties of that uh, uranium-235 uh, isotope that is the isotope that fissions uh, mostly in uh, nuclear uh, reactors uh, then and, uh, and, uh, and today. It produced only gram quantities, but General Leslie Grove knows that the Russians were spying on the uh, uh, American effort. So he kept the, prof the process going to mislead them. And in his memoirs, he called it uh, a white elephant. In fact, the Russians were misled in this direction and uh, they, it was not a very successful process, even though the one in Washington was very successful. So the United States now ended up with two fissile isotopes that could be used in generating a weapon. Remember the Manhattan Project was not looking at any civilian applications at the time. It was primarily a military uh, project. Uh, uh, that project was followed later on, or it, it was not successful. But another process that we are going to describe later, later is what's called gaseous diffusion. So in that case, what you do is that you turn your uranium into a gas. And in that case, I use uranium hexafluoride, U uh, F6. Why fluorine? Uh, because fluorine in nature has only one isotope, F16. And uh, uh, in that case, if you want to separate uranium-235 and uranium-238 as a molecule, you don't want all the isotopes of another element to intervene. But uranium hexafluoride is extremely corrosive, and it needs lots of stages in what is going to be called the enrichment process. You could see the plant that uh, was built there. It was not something that uh, a non-international group uh, can build in their basement. This was a whole national uh, industrial capability devoted to uh, the Manhattan Project. This is uh, it was called the one mile long uh, plant. It uh, was closed in 1987 because another process of separating uranium-235 from uranium has been discovered, centrifugation. Inside those uh, 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 large uh, 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 buildings were cells. This is one of the cells and they're interconnected. Do you see the size of them here with the uh, engineers working on them? First, uranium hexafluoride is very corrosive. So they had to use uh, mild steel, but they plated it with some uh, way of dealing with the corrosion. So they plated it with uh, 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 chromium, and uh, uh, they use also uh, uh, the uh, 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 a way as a way of reducing uh, the corrosion. Uh, uh, what is uh, eventually became uh, uh, stainless uh, steel. So they used uh, uh, chromium uh, as a, uh, a coating on it. Uh, they ended up with two isotopes of uranium. Uh, so that uranium hexafluoride, as you could see here, is stored in those large tanks. At room temperature, uranium hexafluoride is a crystal. So you take this to the plant, you heat it up, you release uranium hexafluoride. Uh, and you are left now with some uranium that has a depleted amount of uranium-235. So that is stored also as primarily the isotope of uranium, uranium-238, and uh, uh, for future use in uh, what would be a different nuclear fuel cycle than we are using uh, today. Uh, the two isotopes of uranium-235 and uranium uh, and plutonium-239 now needed a third site. So the third site that uh, uh, Leslie Grove and uh, Robert Oppenheim uh, chose uh, was at the Los Alamos. That is now today the Los Alamos National Laboratory. There the scientists at what was designated as site W got the plutonium-239 from Washington, the state of Washington, 
and uranium-235 from the state of Tennessee and started building an atomic device. Uh, the, the plutonium uh, is extremely uh, toxic chemically, so they had to invent those uh, basically uh, glove boxes. They could not really touch it, so they had to do it from the outside. Uh, it was extremely corrosive too, so lots of chemistry was done. And as a result of the Manhattan uh, project, they ended up with uh, both plutonium uh, separated. This is a puck uh, or a button and uh, of uh, plutonium-239 shown here, as well as uranium-235, uh, the isotope. I'm talking a lot about isotopes of uranium-235, 238, plutonium-239, and uranium-238. So uh, what are we talking about here? What are we getting that uh, information? Uh, that information comes to us from uh, a different source of data uh, that is basically the uh, 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 structure of the elements uh, in general. And uh, uh, when we deal with uh, chemistry, uh, go back, I'm going back to the website here for you to know where I am uh, going to the data. Uh, we need data uh, uh, about the isotopes uh, and the elements. When we do chemistry, we all know that we deal with the periodic table of the elements. So we can go there to the periodic table of the elements, a reminder of your high school, uh, maybe uh, chemistry. And you know, in the periodic table of the elements, the isotopes are listed in columns. It's also called the Mendeleev uh, table because that's Mendeleev was the first person who started putting it together. And these are the elements as we know them today. They are listed in columns according to the number of electrons in their last shells. Uh, the end column there is uh, uh, noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and uh, I don't remember, this is one of the newer elements, of neon, I think. Uh, in the first column is a metal. The hydrogen is a metal, by the way. Uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and trenchum, and then all the other elements in between, uh, depending on the number of electrons, <coughs> sorry, in their last shell. Two parts of the table uh, are prominent here and here. You can expand really all that last part of the periodic table of elements to the right and put in two rows. One of them here, that row starts with the uh, element, the lanthanum. And the lanthanum, uh, think about that table to be expanded uh, with those two columns inserted here. So you push everything here uh, to uh, the right. And uh, this is called the lanthanide series. Uh, it contains cerium, promethium, neodymium, promethium, samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, dysprosium, holonium, erbium, uh, uh, luthenium. And the one under it is what we call the actinide series. And the actinide series is the one that is of interest to us really in our course. Uh, the lanthanide series is very, very important. For instance, neodymium uh, and those elements in general, the lanthanide series are also called the rare earth elements. They're not that rare, but they're very uh, difficult to uh, separate uh, from uh, their occurrence in their ores. Uh, but uh, they are the elements of the uh, new technologies of uh, renewable. Uh, types of sources of energy. For instance, uh, neodymium is used for building very, very powerful magnets for electrical cars and uh, uh, wind turbines and so on. But the actinide series contains the elements of the nuclear age. These are the elements of the renewable age, the lanthanides, but the actinides contains first, it starts with actinium, but they also have that uranium that we are so much interested in. We have also the thorium, we are all, also interested in it, uh, the protoactinium, uh, uh, that's not palladium, palladium is PG. Protoactinium, neptunium, plutonium, americium, curium, berculium, uh, californium, einsteinium, fermium, uh, mendelevium, nobilium, and laurentium. And they're still discovering more of those uh, heavy uh, elements. The different colors here show us uh, the different names that uh, uh, were adopted from the old uh, conventional uh, chemistry, for instance, uh, the last column uh, with that color here is the noble gases. And uh, the first uh, column here is what you call the alkali uh, metals. And uh, uh, you have basically here our 
famous elements, uh, the actinite. Uh, if you go to the uh, periodic table of the elements, uh, you notice that it's really uh, constructed according to uh, the latest uh, electronic shells uh, in the atomic structure. So it describes the electrical properties of the elements. But if you want to talk about the nuclear properties of the elements, we have to go to another chart or uh, nuclide. And this is what we call the chart of the nuclides or the table of the nuclides. I, uh, I, I like uh, one of the versions here, the previous versions of table of the nuclides. Notice that you have many different versions of the chart of the nuclides. I'll give you assignments to access them. You can access any one you like. The, from Japan, from Brookhaven National Lab in the United States. Kerry is the Korean Atomic Energy Research Institute, the French, Karlsruhe, Germany. Choose the one you like. Uh, let's go to the first one here. And uh, if you go to the previous versions, that's the one that is most documented. It shows us all the, uh, not just the uh, elements uh, that occur in nature, uh, these are the ones, uh, little squares in blue, according to their atomic number Z, which is the number of electrons or the charge of the, uh, of the uh, atoms in that case, against the, uh, uh, so you have Z, the charge, uh, against N. N is the number of neutrons in the isotope. We all know that the elements are uh, described in terms of their number of electrons or their charge, as well as the total number of nucleons, protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So if you have uh, on this uh, X axis, the number of neutrons, you notice that the elements that occur in nature here, the blue dots there, these are all elements that occur in nature. Uh, if you follow the 45 degrees line, that would be the number of protons Z here equal to the number of neutrons here. But in fact, the nuclei in general tend to accommodate a larger number of neutrons than they accommodate uh, protons. So there is a deviation of that line to the right. The blue dots here represent elements that occur in nature, but above them and under them, there is uh, much more of those elements that were created by man. So uh, humans have created more isotopes, in that case, elements with different a uh, number of electrons or uh, different charges, the Z number and different numbers of mass numbers, the uh, capital A, uh, neutrons plus protons. If you want to look at the properties of the elements, uh, chemi chemical properties of the elements, you go to the Mendeleev table of the periodic table of the elements. If you want to look at the nuclear properties like we are doing in our case, you go to the chart of the nuclides or the table of the nuclides. So I would like you to practice and uh, learn how to access data uh, uh, from that uh, uh, chart of the nuclides. You notice here it contains uh, all the elements that are known to us. And if I go back here, uh, if you click on one of those dots here, uh, you are shown that part of the periodic table. Uh, for instance, uh, just at random here, AG is uh, in Latin Argentum, and we all know Argentum is silver. You could see here the blue uh, uh, squares represent the naturally occurring silver uh, isotopes, like, uh, for instance, silver 107, silver 109 occur in nature. But by adding neutrons or irradiating the elements, we can generate all those other isotopes of uh, silver. Instead of silver 107, we can get silver uh, 100, for instance. And uh, if you go there on top here, you can... I'm sorry, I have a phone call. Hello? Uh, anyway, so if you enter, for instance, here, let's enter uh, the... Uh, since you're talking uranium today, let's enter uranium. And uh, if you enter uranium, uh, you get information uh, about uranium. And we discovered that uranium in nature uh, is not 100% uh, uh, uranium-235. It has three isotopes that occur in nature. And 99% in atomic percentage, the number of atoms percent, is the isotope uranium-238. 
But that uranium-238 we'll see later being an even uh, mass number isotope uh, does not fission readily with neutrons. It's really that odd number isotope uranium-235 uh, that only occurs in nature as 0.72% uh, or one in 140 atoms of uranium is the isotope uranium-235. And some very small amount of uranium-234 that comes from the decay or the radioactivity of uranium-235 and uranium-238. However, look how many isotopes humans have created. All those uranium isotopes have been created by uh, humans. So uh, in, uh, in, uh, in today's assignment, you will go to the chart of the nuclides and uh, simply explore uh, the abundance of the isotopes of uranium, the natural occurring isotopes for uranium uh, and their natural uh, abundance. You can go and uh, learn more about the properties of that uranium isotope. Uh, the atomic mass, for instance, is 235.04, and AMU stands for atomic mass uh, unit. And uh, then uh, you find the details about the atomic percent abundance, 0.72%. Because it's only 0.72%, uh, Leslie Grove and Robert Oppenheimer had to separate that odd numbered isotope that only uh, undertakes uh, fission. Let's look about the other isotope that we mentioned today, plutonium. So let's see what are the properties of plutonium. You notice there are no natural isotopes of plutonium. However, humans have created all these isotopes of plutonium by the breeding process using neutrons as a scalpel. Uh, so uh, modern day alchemy, the dream of the alchemists in the Middle Ages, transforming the transition elements like gold and uh, copper into, uh, uh, into gold uh, basically is achieved today in nuclear reactors uh, in general. Uh, let me go, another isotope of interest is carbon. Uh, since we talked about graphite, so we look at carbon. Naturally occurring carbon is 98.89% uh, and carbon 12.1.1%. Uh, fluorine is another isotope, F here, uh, and we can send that here. Notice that fluorine has a single isotope, fluorine-19, hence the uranium hexafluoride that we mentioned. I'll stop here to see whether everything is uh, moving okay, and maybe entertain some questions in general. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat room right now. Okay, it seems that uh, uh, our camera and uh, our microphone is working okay. If you have a question, write it in the chat room. If there are no questions, I'll uh, proceed back again to sharing uh, the screen. Okay, so you could see here that uh, fluorine-19 has only one single isotope. Uranium-235 has a, uh, several isotopes. Plutonium does not exist. Uh, in nature. Other isotopes that we use in the nuclear industry, for instance, uh, 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 let's see, uh, uh, boron, for instance, let's take boron. Uh, boron is used in the control rod because it absorbs neutrons very readily. It's primarily boron 11, 80%, and uh, boron 10, 19%. Uh, uh, and if we want uh, to find the properties of the isotopes that they suggested. Uh, let's look at calcium, for instance. You go calcium and you discover that 96% uh, uh, of calcium in nature is calcium 40, uh, uh, a little amount of calcium 42, 43, 44, 46, you see how many isotopes of calcium we have there uh, in our body. Uh, but uh, isotopes that were created artificially are shown uh, down here. All right, so we suggested then that uh, uh, Leslie Grove and uh, Oppenheimer uh, uh, had to use that plutonium-239 isotope and uranium-235 isotope if they wanted uh, to catch up on what they thought is an effort in Germany to create a nuclear device since fission was discovered in Germany. And uh, that was the idea of the Manhattan Project. As I suggested, uh, uh, both approaches uh, uh, proved that uh, they were feasible and the United States ended up with 
a supply of uh, both the uranium-235 and plutonium-239. In fact, they had more plutonium-239 available than uranium-235 uh, available. So the United States uh, being paranoid about Germany uh, producing a nuclear uh, device uh, basically uh, undertook the Manhattan Project and in both ways, uh, the physical separation of uranium-235 and here shown uranium-235 and the production of plutonium, possible weapons materials were successful. Now, the uh, fear was uh, the fear of Germany developing uh, a fission uh, weapon. Uh, however, uh, what ended up uh, at the last uh, years of Roosevelt uh, uh, is that uh, he died and was superseded by, uh, now in that case, President Truman. Uh, the interesting thing is that the war in Europe ended up uh, uh, before the United States basically was able to produce enough uranium-235 or plutonium-239 for a weapon. Uh, the war ended up in Europe. Uh, Germany uh, surrendered and uh, uh, there was no need to use any weapon on Germany to end the war. Unfortunately, the war continued with Japan in the Pacific region. And it was a very bloody war. Uh, lots of uh, uh, military personnel uh, lost their lives as well as many, many civilians. And now the United States had two possible elements that can produce a tremendous amount of destruction from the energy release from a small amount of material. Now notice here that uh, we'll come to uh, this, uh, this later, that uh, uranium-235 or plutonium-239, uh, basically when they're produced and fresh, are, do not produce too much radiation, except for plutonium, maybe some gamma radiations, uh, which is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, those two gentlemen are holding them basically with uh, uh, rubber or uh, uh, chemical uh, gloves. Uh, so uh, over time though, uh, the radioactivity builds up and uh, it will be uh, unsafe to hold them like in their hands. So in fact, they are worried about the specimens being uh, 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 polluted by say grease or oil from the hands of the people working on them. Notice also that they are flat as pucks. Uh, if they were in the form of a sphere, that would be more conducive to uh, a, a generating a chain reaction. It would be unsafe to uh, hold them in the shape of a sphere uh, because the sphere as a geometric figure has the uh, lowest surface to volume ratio. Hence any neutrons produced would leak from a sphere uh, 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 less than they would uh, leak from the surface of a puck. And in that case, uh, if you reduce the leakage of neutrons from the surface, you can reach a situation where you have a chain reaction, a critical chain reaction. And that's why when they were building the Chicago pile at the beginning of the chapter, uh, they were adding one layer upon one layer uh, to form a sphere. The sphere becomes the least uh, surface to volume ratio geometrical figure, and you can reach easier a chain reaction in a spherical configuration than you have in a flat uh, uh, like puck type of cylindrical configuration. So now Leslie Grove uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and Robert Oppenheimer uh, had a great success, uh, a very limited amount of uranium-235 by the, uh, uh, the calitron uh, process that I said used magnetic fields to separate physically uh, two elements that have the same uh, chemistry, basically uranium-235 and uranium-238, which is a more abundant isotope. And they had also plutonium-239 where the more abundant isotope of uranium-238 that we have looked at in the chart of the nuclides absorbed the neutron from the fission of uranium-235 and produced a new isotope that doesn't exist. There are trace elements in nature, but in general, it is not considered that a naturally occurring element, it's a man-created element, uh, plutonium. All right, so now uh, the scientists knew that a tremendously powerful weapon can be built uh, from uh, these uh, uh, two isotopes. And that's a definition of the nuclear age that we are living today. 
basically, the scientists uh, in the Manhattan Project knew uh, that uh, of the destructive uh, nature of what they came up uh, with. Uh, again, it was a paranoid fear of Germany. We have a chapter on the German program uh, uh, that shows that the Germans really were never serious about producing a weapon out of, uh, I think, uh, uh, their politics and their uh, uh, scientific, basically, policies. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, uh, Harry Truman himself, in his diary, uh, he wrote that uh, note here that I'll uh, quote from him. We have discovered the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. It may be the fire destruction prophesized by the Euphrates Valley era near Noah and his fabulous ark. This weapon is to be used against Japan. We will use it so that military objectives and soldiers and sailors are the target and not women and children. Even if the Japs are savages, ruthless, merciless, and fanatic, we as a leader of the world for the common welfare cannot drop that terrible bomb on the old capital or the new. The law target will be purely military one. So Truman knew uh, about the destructive nature of the uh, uh, weapons. However, the scientists uh, knew, all, uh, 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 knew also about it on July 17, 1945. Uh, they wrote a petition to the president of the United States, ironically suggesting that that weapon should be first tested before used in warfare. And these are their uh, signatures right here. And uh, Wigner, for instance, but you also will find uh, uh, Zillard signing it there. So Zillard, who started the whole process with his letter uh, with uh, Albert Einstein, uh, was one of the leaders who thought about uh, how to test the atomic bomb before uh, uh, using it on Japan. Uh, the, war, the war, as you know, was still raging in the Pacific. Now, with, uh, we'll see that uh, to use the uh, uranium-235 was a straightforward process. Uh, to create a critical mass, uh, you bring in two pieces of uranium-235 and you shoot them into each other. And in that case, in a gun barrel, in fact, simple gun barrel, uh, you can create a chain reaction and that chain reaction can produce thousands thousands of tons of TNT equivalent. TNT is trinitrotoluene, which is a high uh, explosive. Plutonium-239, though, uh, is not uh, as simple to use in warfare because it is producing neutrons through a process of spontaneous fission. There are neutrons produced. So before you create a critical mass, those neutrons can fizzle the process by generating the neutrons too early. So you have to create the critical mass at a, the speed of sound. And in that case, you use what's called the implosion process. We'll study the implosion process by the end of sem the semester uh, under the uh, uh, topic of uh, fusion in general. So uh, a plutonium device had to take basically a shape where you get the plutonium in the center surrounded by uh, explosives, explosive lenses in that case, to take uh, basically a shock wave from an initiator of the explosive, the initiator generates a wave that is divergent. And when you give it that shape here of blocks of TNT or an explosive, you turn the uh, uh, diverging shock wave and turn it around to come in and hit the, uh, the, uh, the core of that plutonium-239 in a uniform uh, convergent rather than divergent wave. Remember again, the initiator of the explosive is a divergent wave. It looks like this, and the shape turns it around to make it convergent uh, on the mass of the plutonium. So you compress the plutonium, the nuclei come close together, and you have a critical mass. At the center, you have an initiator that is a source of neutrons. For instance, you can have a piece of beryllium and a piece of uh, uh, polonium uh, polonium emits alpha particles when uh, put it in the center of a ping pong ball, maybe. And uh, when the sphere of uranium uh, of plutonium is compressed, the polonium emits uh, alpha particles. They interact with the beryllium, produce neutrons. So this would be like a spark plug that starts the reaction. The plutonium has to be contained in a tamper. You could use maybe uh, gold uh, or you can use uranium uh, as a matter of fact. The difficulty there is that that shock wave in what's called the explosive lenses 
has to be initiated electronically at all at the same time. And this is basically as a shape of a, an implosion type of a reaction that is used with the plutonium uh, devices. Uh, you can use it, uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, some disclosure about the Iranian program that has been discontinued in nuclear weapons thinks about using not plutonium in the center, but using uranium-235 uh, to create a critical mass rather than the, uh, what we are going to call it the gun barrel concept. So uh, the use of plutonium had to be very, very uh, specialized. This, uh, the source of that graph is from uh, the uh, book. At, you'll find it at, if it's still there, uh, hasn't been stolen somehow, at the undergraduate library. You know that the University of Illinois as an undergraduate library built underground to protect the uh, Moro plots, uh, which are experimental plots for the growing of corn. So the library was uh, built underground so that uh, we do not shade those Moro plots uh, uh, and the south of campus. As this is a picture of that configuration that I mentioned to you. Uh, uh, it's a museum mock-up. This would be the explosive lenses, TNT, maybe any explosive, high explosive. This would be where the initiators go. Uh, this would be the sphere uh, containing the plutonium, and that would be the sphere of plutonium with that initiator in the center from uh, one of the museums. So that uh, plutonium uh, device of implosion was not, uh, uh, they were not sure whether it would work or not, so they had to test it. And uh, that test was designated or named by Robert Oppenheimer as a Trinity test. So you could see here uh, a spherical kind of uh, enclosure uh, and uh, with those technicians and engineers. And uh, uh, in the center, uh, they would place that sphere of plutonium and this would be the high explosives and the initiators will come on the surface. To get uh, an optimal uh, shock wave, uh, destructive wave, uh, they uh, the fluid uh, mechanics and uh, engineers suggested that to get the maximum uh, effect from the blast wave or the shock wave, uh, it was had to be uh, exploded on top of a tower. I'll show you how in a moment. Uh, before they installed the initiators here, uh, uh, where the holes are covered with tape, they raised it to on top of a tower in the desert of New Mexico. And I uh, show here the tower. They raised it to the top of the tower. Now the initiators have been uh, connected. So the electronics parts of it, uh, which is a very uh, detailed concept. And this is the final device that had to be tested uh, in the as a desert of New Mexico at Alamo Gordo. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was cognizant of Indian culture. So he called it the Trinity test. So the first test of a plutonium device uh, was uh, named the Trinity test. They had 32 initiators around the sphere, and this is a replica of that device in one of the museums uh, in uh, New Mexico. Uh, the, on, uh, the test was tested, uh, and you could see the explosion happened on top of a tower. Uh, if you drop a pebble in water, you'll find that it generates waves. The waves propagate to the outside, but then they come to the shore and they reflect. So the height of the tower was uh, uh, designed uh, optimally so that you get interference between the initial shock wave coming down to the ground and the reflected shock wave. When they combine together, they create what's called the stem wave. That wave propagates now horizontally and becomes extremely destructive to buildings and uh, uh, structures. So in that case, uh, that was uh, uh, the test in the morning. Uh, when the test, uh, 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 he quoted the Robert Oberheimer from the Bhagavad Gita, that's an Indian uh, 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 literature. If the radius of his southern suns were to burst at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Uh, the uh, explosion itself, of course, generates a quite tremendous amount of heat. It forms a fireball, as you could see here. The air, the nitrogen uh, in the air and the oxygen is ionized. 
the hot gases now are hot, so the density of the gas is low. So that bubble or that uh, a big bubble starts rising up from the ground. You could see it rising here. As it rises from the ground, it sucks out the ground to the top and then takes the shape of a mushroom. So this is a mushroom cloud from nuclear reaction. In fact, if you look at the internal of it, uh, you find that it is basically a huge vortex. What is being sucked from the ground goes and rotates around while the whole mushroom rises into the atmosphere. Now, the neutrons would have reacted with the dust in the ground. Uh, they would have turned the elements in the dust there or the ground into radioactive elements. So in that case, when you have an explosion like this, the dust and the radioactive elements rise into the atmosphere, and then it spreads all over the world. And that's why nuclear explosions uh, uh, in the air or aerial explosions are banned today because of that effect uh, in general. Okay, now let's become back again more quantitative and look about how much energy is being released. I suggested uh, uh, earlier on that uh, a chemical reaction is typically say the ionization energy of hydrogen uh, is only about 13.6 electron volt. But a single fission fragment from the fission of the uranium-235 or plutonium-239 isotopes produces not 13.6 electron volt, but 165 million electron volt in those fission pro uh, 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 products, uh, two uh, pieces of the uranium-235 spilling apart. Remember that they are ions, so they have a large charge. So the Coulomb repulsion itself is 165 million electron volt, plus or minus five because of the measurement error. The, uh, pro the explosion also produces gamma rays. Gamma rays is very high energy electromagnetic radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the gamma rays are really nothing than uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation, but it has a very, very high energy uh, or very, very short wavelengths. Uh, you'll find that that produces another 7 million electron volts of energy. The fission neutrons themselves carry five because there are two and two and a half uh, neutrons at 2 million electron volt each, they produce another 5 million electron volt. Uh, beta particles, the beta particles we know are electrons emitted from those fission products, they're radioactive, 7 million electron volts. Then you get delayed gamma radiation uh, after the fission products start, uh, they're radioactive, so they emit their extra energy as gamma radiation. And then all this uh, uh, release of beta particles, electrons, uh, in physics is associated with the production of anti-neutrinos, which are particles that have almost zero mass. And there was a debate whether they had a mass or not. And it was proven that they do indeed have a mass and then Nobel Prize was awarded to the people who discovered that it carries 10 million electron volts. So if you add all that energy together, uh, a fi single fission of a nucleus produces 200 million electron volt of energy plus or minus six. However, those anti-neutrinos are very interesting particles in the universe. They can go through the whole earth or come to us from the other side of the earth without interaction. So this energy from the anti-neutrinos is not available uh, for uh, the device itself. So in calculations in general, uh, we need to subtract that 10 a million electron volt, uh, which is unavailable energy from the fusion uh, products. On top of it, the uh, fission fragments uh, continue producing energies at 3 million electron volt. Uh, the uh, uh, beta uh, particles are not available initially. You subtract 7 million electron volt. Uh, the gamma rays from the fission pr products also uh, subtract 6. So in general, those 2 million, elect 100 million electron volts, we have only 180 million electron volt available for the fission process, whether you're building a nuclear reactor or you're building a nuclear device. Many textbooks uh, take the 200 figure, uh, but of course uh, it's significantly different than uh, 180, that's a 10% uh, difference uh, between the two figures. So. Uh, we will adopt in our uh, class 180 million electron volt as the energy release from a single fission event. Anti-neutrinos, interestingly enough, now are generated in the process of producing nuclear energy in nuclear reactors, but they're also produced in fission uh, 
phenomena when you have nuclear weapons. So if you have seen a movie about the fact that our coming back to our technological civilization uh, and the Kardashev scale, uh, the fact that we exploded nuclear weapons, uh, the fact that uh, we have nuclear reactors operating now, generating anti-neutrinos, we have announced ourselves as a technological civilization to the rest of the universe, if there are any other technological intelligent civilizations, by the release of these anti-neutrinos. They're like a beacon pointing out to that little spot that rotates around the sun, our star, uh, where anti-neutrinos are being produced. So it's the same way as uh, electromagnetic radiation from radio waves and TV emissions. Uh, we have announced our technological civilization to the rest of the universe. Uh, the uh, uh, energy release, as I suggested, uh, had to use uh, is measured in terms of how much energy it produces in terms of or uh, 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 in terms of uh, the chemical explosions. And uh, so when we describe the yield of nuclear weapons, we describe it in terms of TNT equivalents or kilotons of TNT equivalents. So what is TNT? TNT is a chemical explosive. Uh, this is its composition chemical uh, equation. When it releases energy, it turns into carbon monoxide, hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon, and releases 608,000 joules uh, from a single molecule. Uh, we calculate here the molecular weight of TNT and uh, discover that uh, one uh, uh, ton or one, remember that's a metric ton of uh, TNT, uh, uh, produces 1,000 tons of TNT. Kiloton stands for kilo in Greek. That's 1,000. 1,000 ton of TNT produces 10 to the 12 calories. We can turn this into million electron volts, ergs, joule. But it is really equivalent 1,000 tons of TNT to the fission of 56.8 grams of fissile nuclei, or two ounces of fissile nuclei, or this is the fission of 10 to the 23rd fissile uh, nuclei at 200, uh, 180 uh, million electron volt uh, uh, generated in each one of them. Uh, the weapons that uh, use the uranium-235 uh, and the uh, plutonium-239 uh, were unfortunately dropped uh, after the Trinity test that used plutonium. Uh, the first weapon used, the next weapon used uranium-235 and that was dropped on Hiroshima uh, and basically uh, ended uh, somehow uh, the Second World War uh, in the Pacific with Japan. It was followed uh, unnecessarily, some people argue, uh, by a second device that was dropped on Nagasaki. And the one on Nagasaki uh, used, in that case, the plutonium-238 uh, device uh, uh, in JAMA. Uh, to get the equivalence of TNT, uh, kiloton of T so uh, nuclear weapons today, in fact, are uh, designed in the range of 100 kiloton of TNT. So that's uh, we are talking about thousands of ton TNT in something the size of a grapefruit. <coughs> and uh, the fusion or uh, thermonuclear weapons are not are even 1,000 times uh, more powerful. And we'll cover that in the next chapter. We are talking about megatons of TNT. So humanity basically has discovered uh, a source of all energies. Uh, fusion uh, is a nuclear process that happens in the stars in general. And uh, we discovered fission, that uh, both of them are natural phenomena that were not known to man before the 1940s, but uh, humanity has to live with them uh, today in terms of the huge amount of energy possible release. To calculate how many fissions and uh, how many grams uh, uh, produce 1,000 tons uh, of explosive of TNT, uh, we can take the kiloton of TNT, we said that is equivalent to 10 to the 12 calories of energy release, uh, multiply that by 4.2 joules per calorie, calorie cancels with calorie, uh, turn your joule into electron volt, so you divide by the charge of the electron, 1.6 cent to minus 19 joule per electron volt, turn your electron volt into million electron volts, so you multiply by one, uh, divide by one million, basically million electron volt per electron volt. 
So now the energy release from one kiloton of TNT is in million electron volt, divide by uh, the, uh, the figure that we took 180 in the table, 180 million electron volts per fission here, and you get basically that that is caused, uh, caused by the fissioning of uh, that very large amount of nuclei, but it's a very small mass. So you find that 10 to the 23rd nuclei here in the table are fission to produce one kiloton of TNT. We can use uh, Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law is uh, a law from physical chemistry that you have studied in your classes on chemistry that tells that a number of nuclei uh, uh, in a one gram molecule, which is the mass of the material divided by its molecular weight, multiplied into a constant of nature. Avogadro's number gives me the number of atoms in the one gram molecular weight, G divided into M. So if you divide that number of nuclei by uh, the N, uh, you can calculate the G, the mass of the material that will generate one kiloton of energy. I'll give you an example here. G would be N multiplied into M dividing Avogadro's number, and that would be 56.8 gram. That's the way that number in the table uh, was uh, derived here, 56.8 grams of fissile material. So if you take the... Uh, uh, atomic bomb on Hiroshima, uh, it was about 15 kilotons, or let's say 20 kilotons, then multiply that by 56 grams that you could see it's a very small amount of material that turned into uh, really energy. In fact, the, uh, it's only a very small fraction of the plutonium in the weapon that produces that energy. Uh, the critical mass say, of plutonium 239 is about uh, imploded six kilograms unimploded is 10 kilograms, but for uranium-235, it's about 54 kilograms. We'll, we'll calculate that later. Uh, and uh, only a small amount of it produces the energy release. So in fact, we can calculate the efficiency of the Hiroshima and the uh, uh, plutonium uh, devices uh, in general. I have discussed here the distinction between a nuclear reactor and a, a, the, a nuclear device. Uh, what I would like you to remember just uh, is that uh, 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 the, a nuclear reactor can never, never explode as uh, a nuclear bomb. Notice here uh, the need for a tamper uh, that surrounds the uh, core of that plutonium-239. In fact, on the 4th of July, you'll find some daring individuals who will use those uh, uh, firecrackers and uh, if you explode it on the surface of the ground, the shockwave dissipates itself, no harm made. But if you place it inside a container like a coffee can, uh, it becomes extremely dangerous. And uh, if you find somebody trying to do it, please dissuade them because the uh, expansion of the gases that do work on the material that they're enclosed in and can cause lots of uh, damage. A nuclear reactor does not have a temper it is not being uh, uh, exploded with chemical explosives. So the worst that you can get in a nuclear reactor is the release of energy that would melt the core, uh, even vaporize part of it, and immediately that melting uh, uh, destroys the configuration that reaches uh, the critical mass uh, in that case. As I suggested, uh, the United States now had a supply of plutonium-239 and a supply of uranium-235. And uh, the argument came out how to use this uh, to end the war in the Pacific. Many people objected to it. Uh, many people uh, came, uh, uh, advocated it. And the group that advocated the ending the war by using the nuclear uh, devices won the argument. Even though there is lots of arguing about the argument that I can, you can read about in the appendix. I added an appendix about the issue of whether it was the, a good idea to use uh, uh, the weapons to end the war because Japan already was trying to negotiate to end the war. They were fearful of the Russians uh, joining uh, uh, the war and uh, uh, they uh, basically, they were ready to uh, find an agreement with the United States. Uh, in the end here, uh, for today's lecture at least, 
uh, this is the, what happened to the tower after the Trinity test. Uh, this is Robert Oppenheimer here uh, and Leslie Grove here. And it vaporized the tower seen from the sky. That's what you could see at the site there. That site is open once a year for visitors. Uh, they built that uh, monument on the ground zero, the Trinity site. Uh, it is now a historical site open to the public only once a year on the first Saturday of the month of October. So if you find your way there, 